If the WWE is going to choose to oversaturate the marketplace with their product, then they could at least present us with a good product, or at least make a more concerted effort, genuinely, to provide us with a better product. Also, if this company is going to insist with this brand split on basically most months expecting the fans to watch two pay-per-views, and then if there's a month where there's an NXT show, it might be three potentially on the network, then the company needs to really go above and beyond to make sure they give us a reason to feel like all that time spent on their product is justified. Now, a couple weeks back, we had Backlash, the first lone SmackDown pay-per-view, and I thought it was an adequate show. And just adequate, nothing more. It, it, you need more than that. It needs to be more than just adequate, especially when your television is so lacking right now. These special events need to feel like special events. Like, as much as I think the NXT show is lacking in terms of what they air each week for that hour or whatever, at least when you watch the special events, they feel like special events for that brand. You don't get that with the Raw and SmackDown pay-per-views. That's the problem in years past, and it most certainly is a problem now. It most certainly was a problem with this Clash of Champions show. I did not have high expectations for this card. Frankly, before I started watching it, I had no real desire to frankly watch any of these matches because none of them interested me in any way, shape, or form. And now that I actually finally got the chance to sit down and watch the show from beginning to end, I can see why I had no expectations for it. I could see why I wasn't looking forward to it. And I don't know why I would continue to watch a Raw pay-per-view and a SmackDown pay-per-view each month. This is insanity. This is madness. This was not only not a good special event, this wouldn't even, I don't think, classify as a good episode of Raw. Clash of Champions most certainly did not live up to the name. That's for damn sure. Sometimes when I'm watching a WWE show, or in particular a pay-per-view, I'll get that one kind of theme at the beginning, and it just follows me throughout the course of the night. It's the one thing I gravitate to, I latch onto, that I hold onto, that becomes a primary focus of what I ultimately talk about in the videos. And in this particular case, Clash of Champions, the one thing that stood out to me the most from the very beginning of the night and carried its way pretty much all the way through the night was psychology. And in particular, regrettably, the lack of psychology. In the matches, in the way the performers worked, in the way they interacted, in the way that the matches were structured and played out, just a total and complete lack of psychology. It's just unbelievable. No wonder people gravitate towards the spot fest and the bullshit because they get the short attention span because this company does nothing to try and actually get you emotionally engaged in any real or substantive way. Like it all starts with the opening match, the tag title match, New Day defending against the ball jobber club, if you will. Um, it's, it's a smart idea to start off the show with the New Day, you get the people excited right away. But the psychology of this match was atrocious. You know, what, I used to love tag team wrestling. In a lot of cases, I'm not the only fan. Love tag team wrestling more than singles wrestling. Because the action could be quicker, you had more intricacies, you had more possibilities and potentials with said match of what you could do. And one of the key things to any great tag match, if you have a face and a heel team, is you have one of the faces getting all of the heat. See Ricky Morton. You have the guys that get that heat. You hope they can get some Ricky Morton type of heat. And then they go and do the hot tag. In this match, Kofi, Big E, neither one of them is getting the real heat. And in this case, it should be Kofi that's getting the heat. He's not getting the heat. Then ultimately, there's no hot tag, so that big climactic moment in this tag match doesn't happen. And instead of Big E coming in and be coming in like gangbusters and having that heroic kind of spotlight heat blow-off moment and being the big dude and working like a big dude, they're working him like he's a little dude. Big E should not be working like Kofi. Kofi should not be working like Big E. Kofi should be working like Kofi. Big E should be working like Big E. Big E should not be getting beat down like Kofi, who is supposed to be the guy in this match in theory that should be getting the heat to engage in the hot tag to Big E. Then you got the use of Francesca, and it's just the whole psychology of this was so bad on so many different levels. Right team won, but they need to hurry up and get the straps off of these guys before they start to lose some of their luster, their buzz, and their flavor. You need to either... Hurry up and build up a heel tag team. Just take the straps off of them pronto. 
or you need to just bring Amori and Cassidy at him and get the belt off him and just transition to another entertaining babyface tag team. As the New Day are in a good position, but the problem is pretty soon it's going to become a comfortable position for them and more importantly a comfortable position for the company and that could be dangerous to all three of these characters, most importantly of all, Big E! Before I talk about the Cruiserweight Championship match, let me say one thing. I think TJ Perkins sucks. I think he's boring as piss. I think there's no difference between him and hundreds, if not thousands, of other vanilla midgets all throughout the country on the independent circuit, flipping and kicking with no psychology, without any clue on how to actually make things matter or any consequence, actually working a match. With that said, I think it's ridiculous that people are shitting on him because he's talking about the fact that he was homeless at one point in time, and people in the locker room apparently are pissed, well, I was homeless, I was homeless at one point in time. Okay, yeah, so I was fucking homeless too. I don't come on here and talk about it all the fucking time, mind you. But it's a part of who I am. I shouldn't be shit on it for him, for it. And I'm most certainly not going to shit on TJ Perkins for it. And the people that are shitting on him, fuck you. Just fuck you. Stop being petty bitches and be better at your job, period. Now, when it comes to the Cruiserweight Championship, I talked before about how I thought it was stupid that Raw was going to have a Cruiserweight division. And ultimately, I'll be right. I don't care what anybody says. Now, granted, the Cruiserweights have a place. But the problem is, especially on Raw, they have no purpose. And you saw that in the way they were booked on the Raw heading into Clash of Champions. Instead of featuring the champion, introducing the champion, you just got this random fucking four-way match where it's as much about Mick Foley as it is anything. And here we've got this whole 32-man tournament that leads up to this culminating point. And we put the belt on somebody that most of the WWE audience, in theory, doesn't know any fucking thing about and doesn't care about. And in the meantime, we've got Brian Kendrick, who fans are familiar with, who do know who he is. And on top of that, is a far better all-around performer than T.J. Perkins. So, of course, we had T.J. Perkins win the Cruiserweight Classic. We gave him the title. Now you have a chance to rectify this here and put the belt on the right person to rectify your mistake from the Cruiserweight Classic by putting the belt on Brian Kendrick. So, of course, they didn't. As far as this match goes, the psychology and the match stretcher was completely shit. I don't know if this is a conscientious effort by the WWE to slow these guys down to stop, get them to stop flipping and kicking, but I'm not going to fully just peg it on the WWE powers that be. These two guys need to fucking know better. This match was horrible. I don't give a fuck what you say. These are the guys, as the Cruiserweights, that should be doing the crazy, insane, off-the-wall shit. That should be part of their calling card. These are the guys that should be the spot monkeys. And instead, they're fucking the smallest guys on the roster, and they're lumbering around the ring like goddamn giants with so many ridiculous submission attempts. This is not the technical wrestling division. This is the Cruiserweight division. People are not going to care about 170-pound guys putting other 170-pound guys in submission holds all fucking night. They want to see fast-paced, up-tempo action. That's part of the reason you have a cruiserweight division. So whoever pieced this match together, whoever was the agent on this, should be fucking bitch-slapped. Because this was ridiculous. It's even more ridiculous that TJ Perkins retained his title here. The only redeeming quality of all of this was Brian Kendrick headbutting him at the end. It is an outrage and an injustice. You want me to care about the cruiserweights? Put the belt on Brian Kendrick where the fuck it belongs because as a heel, as the one recognizable face in that division, the one actual real character in that division, you can feed the Cedric Alexanders and the TJ Perkins and whoever the fuck else all to him. That's how you do it. Take the familiar name and get other people over. Now you're taking the new name and you're trying to get familiar people over? That makes no fucking sense. Because this company doesn't know how to book fucking cruiserweights. You really trust Vince McMahon, of all people, and Triple H to know how to book cruiserweights? Give me a fucking break. As an old wrestling fan, there's a part of me that really enjoys the occasional best of five, best of seven series of matches. I think when done right, with the right people, the right story, the right purpose and execution, they can really be a nice breath of fresh air. Now, I don't know if I'm a huge fan of them in the current WWE climate, especially on Raw, because while some of the sheep will point out the 15- or 20-minute promo most weeks to open up the night, they'll forget about all the other randomly thrown-together, boring-ass wrestling that dominates most of the remaining three hours of Raw. You know, So we don't need another story based off of 
the wrestling, the in-ring stuff, because everything else is just basically that. Now, with that said, it can still work, but you can't have every single match finish with a pinfall or submission. You need to have DQs in there. You need to have countouts. You need to have knockouts. You need to have double countouts and kicking people out and injuries and time limits. There are so many different things you could do to be very creative in a series. And if you really want to think about it, you could do a best of seven and predictably have it go the distance, but you could have it where nobody gets a real decisive victory at any point in time. You could do a doctor stoppage for one, a DQ, a count out, a time limit on one of them. You could do a double count out. You could do so many different things, a double pinfall. I mean, you could really get to the point by the time you got to the seventh match, it's 1-1 or it's 0-0. And you're still trying to figure out who the better man is. That, to me, works so much better on so many different levels than as opposed to the what they did here, which is Sheamus win the first three matches and Cesaro wins the next three matches. And then we get to the seventh one. Oh, is he going to fulfill the big comeback? Or is Sheamus going to choke? Or is Sheamus going to hold on? I just don't think the story is as powerful or it's the same. On top of the fact already that you know, you're talking about more wrestling on a show that doesn't need the same type of random wrestling. You know, you always have enough predictability on Raw. We don't need another thing where it's predictable that the thing's going to go the whole seven. You want to shake shit up a little bit, have Sheamus or Cesaro sweep or win four matches to one or even four matches to two. Don't go to that seventh match. Now, in terms of this match and the choice of the two individuals for this, I'm fine with having the seventh match be at a pay-per-view like Clash of Champions. That's good. And in theory, I think the choice of Sheamus and Cesaro is also pretty good. These are two heavyweight type of guys that wrestle a kind of brawling style, but they are athletic enough and can move enough to where they're not big, lumbering, slow guys where you run the risk of boring the audience. They can do enough different things together, and they have decent chemistry. And I think you could see that in this match that there was pretty good chemistry between these two. Now, as I've talked about so often, even if the action is good, even if the story told during the match is good, if the finish sucks, then it's all for naught. Because that's everything you're building to is the finish. Now, I'm actually, in theory, okay with the finish. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be pissed off about this finish. To me, the bigger concern is not so much this finish as what they do with the follow-up and the aftermath of the finish, which we know is already shit and going to continue to be shit. I'm okay with doing that kind of washout finish here that they did and kind of leaving it up for grasp who was the better man. I just thought it could have been executed better. I thought it could have been done better. Instead of having the doctors coming out there and stopping it, that's kind of a bitch way to do it. At least have these guys do something crazy and insane as the culmination in this seventh match of this grudge match between the two of them, and both are desperate to prove that they're the better guy, do some type of crazy, ridiculous bullshit where they're both out for the 10 count. You're not having them doctors get involved. You're not doing any of this dumb shit. You know, there's these two fucking warriors sit there. And even if you want to choose at this point in time to do the double pinfall, you know, it still leaves that element of doubt, and it still potentially creates a re real legitimate reason to have a return match, which is a lost art in professional wrestling and in the WWE today. You still don't know who the better guy is. You still haven't settled the issue. So in theory, I'm okay with the finish in terms of the decision to not have somebody go over clean. At the end of the day, though, I understand why a lot of people didn't like it. A lot of people were pissed off with it because they know it's going to be stupid after this. And it feels like this whole thing, as was so often the case with WWE and all the things they do now, was just one gigantic waste of time. And I understand it because at the end of the day, did either one of these guys really benefit from this? Probably not. It probably was, ultimately, a giant waste of time. Chris Jericho versus Sami Zayn was an incredibly boring, sloppy botch fest. This shit was bad. The only things good about this match were twofold. Number one was that it fucking ended at some point in time. Thank God. And number two, that was Fifi. He loves the PP, Chris Jericho, beating Sami Zayn. Other than that, this was easily, to me, the worst match of the night and one that I'll try to erase from my memory just like I do the suspect-ass way Chris Jericho is presenting himself nowadays. Oh! Now, when it comes to the women's championship match, I do want to say one thing here really quickly. I'm not a fan of Charlotte. So I'll say that. With that said, though, Charlotte, Sasha Banks, and especially Bayley are far more interesting than the majority of the men on the roster. 
Like, it's not even close. Like, actually, look at these three, and each of them looks different. They present themselves differently. I appreciate that. It's a fresh feeling to get from something out of the WWE. There's some uniqueness there. I have a great appreciation for that. So I want them to take care of these women because they can be a breath of fresh air for this product. And instead, the WWE does the same old traditional stupid booking that they seem to always fall into with the women's division. Now, let me get this straight. You've got a heel champion with a big bruising bitch and Dana Brooke at her side. It's a triple threat match for Charlotte's title. And yet, Dana Brooks barely getting involved. Let me emphasize again, this is a triple threat for the title. Triple threat in WWE, meaning there's no disqualifications. So henceforth, as a result, at the very least, if Charlotte is supposed to be the cerebral champion, you're telling me she can't be a smart enough fucking chicken shit heel to understand, hey, I could just basically have a glorified tag match and nobody can do shit about it. Or we can hurry up and take one of them out and we can make it a two-on-one match and I can hurry up and get the fuck out of here. Or I can sit there and have this girl help me while I pin this girl and the match is over. Bob's your uncle. We go back and celebrate. Whip out her dicks. But instead, they have Dana out there and she occasionally gets involved, but the whole time it's just screaming out to me. The announcers multiple times are emphasizing this is no disqualification. Any rational thinking fan has to be thinking, then why the fuck is this other bitch, big bitch, not in the ring the entire fucking time? Fucking wasting everybody, laying havoc in waste to Bailey and Sasha. This makes no fucking sense. Makes no sense. And it was stupid. This match is stupid. The psychology of it is stupid. Like, there are times where Dana Brooke gets involved, but then there's one point in time where Sasha and Bailey are in the ring, Charlotte and Dana are on the outside, and one's trying to pin the other in the ring, and they're just standing there. What the fuck are you doing? Who books this shit? And then furthermore, to top it off, the worst thing, Charlotte fucking retains her damn title. So therefore, further validating that what they did with Sasha Banks was a complete waste of time. Therefore taking away a chance here to really do something nice with Bailey and have her win the fucking title. You know, they try to force you to think that Charlotte is actually really good. The only thing that I see right now that she has in common with her dad is that pretty much every one of her matches is the same. The tempo is inconsistent, it's sloppy and botchy, and doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And then she wins and you're kind of like, eh. That's what her dad's career was built off of. It was the foundation of Ric Flair's 16 world titles. Frankly, she's a shitty champion. And ultimately, now we're going to be bored to bricks for months with her second title reign. And her second title reign is ultimately going to end the same way that her second marriage did. Badly. It'll be a disaster. She's not good in marriage. And she most certainly is not a good women's champion. And I saw some websites that there was making the argument, could she be the greatest wrestler in the women's division in WWE history? You're fucking kidding me? Holy shit. I have to say, most certainly my favorite match of the night, and I would argue the best wrestling match of the night, was the U.S. title match between Roman Reigns and Rusev. Now, I know because Roman Reigns was in it, a lot of fans are already programmed to shit all over this. It's whatever. Roman is better in the ring than people want to give him credit for. I most certainly would rather sit through a Roman Reigns match than a Dean Ambrose match or a Dolph Ziggler match any day of the fucking week. I'm sorry. Especially a Dean Ambrose match. Roman's better in the ring than he's given credit for. It's the other stuff that, to me, really holds him back. The fact that he has the personality of paint drying and he's not good on the microphone and then... To top that all off, the WWE still hasn't figured out how to feature, feature this guy in a way that could really make him interesting to see. But in the ring, he can bring it. And I, I wish people would stop shitting on him for that element. Because frankly, I get just as much enjoyment out of his matches than I do Seth Rollins, if not more. And he most certainly, again, is much more entertaining in the ring than Dean Ambrose is, period. You might want to argue against the former, but I don't see how the fuck you can argue against the latter. I'm just saying. I also want to give props to Rusev, because I see progression in him as a performer. This dude's good. He's actually really good. And I have a real appreciation for him in this match and in general, 
him actually trying to work the crowd, him actually trying to implement in-ring and crowd psychology. It's like a breath of fresh air coming over me. You know, working is working the crowd, not the flips off the fucking top turnbuckle. But Rusev's good. He's really good. And I hope people start to gain a greater appreciation for how good he is for a dude of his size. I mean, one, yeah, he's one of these big muscle dudes, so of course I like him. No, you actually watch him. He has some really good fucking matches. And it's not just because of flips and kicks. It's because the guy actually makes what he does matter sometimes. He tries to get the crowd worked. He tries to utilize some in-ring psychology. What a fucking novel concept in professional wrestling. Now, I'm not a huge fan of Roman Reigns going over here, because so I don't like the thought at this time of putting the U.S. title on Roman Reigns. I think it's better served on Rusev, although there's a part of me that doesn't want to see it on Rusev either, because I don't want to get him stuck in this spot. You know, but for the time being, you know, especially if you want to build up Roman to be the next guy to take on Kevin Owens, which is a possibility of what you could do, then I would want to keep the belt off of Roman. If you're not going to go there, that's fine too. Then putting the belt on him is not the worst thing to do. I'm down with seeing these guys next month at, I think it's Hell in a Cell. Yeah, put these two guys in a Hell in a Cell. They could probably tear the damn house down. They, they'll at least do it for me. Because like I said, this match was really, really good. And my appreciation for Rusev is only growing stronger by the month. And then we get to the WWE Universal title match. Now, I will tell you, I'm okay with Kevin Owens being the champion right now. And while I have my things to say sometimes about Owens in certain ways, I think those of you that have followed me since the beginning of doing this, going back to 2010, know that I've been a fan of Kevin Steen over the past several years. He's actually one of those guys that was an indie star that I was actually down with his crown and some of the stuff that he did. However, with that said, I didn't want to come on to a WWE pay-per-view and feel like I was watching an ROH pay-per-view from 2009 and 2010, and this main event felt like just that. It's basically Tyler Black versus Kevin Steen. Fair or not, that's what it felt like to me. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Where you've got Kevin Steen supposed to be the villain, but instead of trying to act like a villain at certain points in times, he's trying to do cool shit and he's trying to get himself over, and it just it doesn't work. And one of the things, granted, that really hurts this match to me, is a lack of Triple H. And it's understandable, and I get it, because God needs his WrestleMania match. As I talk about every year, it's one of the most important things for the company. It's a number one priority as much as anything else. God needs his seven-figure Mania payout. He needs to get himself the right Mania opponent. And Seth Rollins is that perfect Mania opponent for him in 2017 in Orlando at WrestleMania 33. So, slow playing it and building it up over a period of months and months, you know, that's fine. There's a lot of ways you can go, and you can keep these guys together but also apart between now and March and April of 2017, and you can have yourself a monster match at WrestleMania 33. It doesn't mean, though, that for the time being, keeping some of that distance because you dove into it so early isn't going to hurt things now. And this does hurt things now. Because you got Triple H, he did something, but there's been no real explanation, no major justification. You got Stephanie there, it just, it doesn't help. Now, like I said, if you're going to go to Triple H and Seth Rollins earlier, like Royal Rumble or earlier, then there's a problem. You need to be in on these two a little bit more, and Triple H needs to be involved here. If you're not, and that's why you got Chris Jericho involved, so be it, I get it. But it doesn't mean it doesn't hurt the match. Now, Jericho getting involved is sensible, but it doesn't necessarily help Owens either. This is Owens' first title defense on a pay-per-view. He needs that spotlight. He needs to be able to show that he's a viable, legitimate threat because he's the type of guy that's big enough as a champion that you should be envisioning him being able to wrestle the 210-pound dude and being able to wrestle the big fucking dudes like the Brock Lesners and the Undertakers of the world. And him struggling to beat a 220-pound Seth Rollins and having to get help from a 215-pound Chris Jericho isn't really doing him any favors. Now, at the end of the day, the right guy won. And you're trying to continue this bromance between Jericho and Owens. And eventually, maybe you could split off Jericho when he gets bored of being a heel. And you could send him at Owens in the short term as kind of like a bridge the gap feud for the title. And that's fine, too. Um... But ultimately, I have to confess, uh, 
There was nothing climatic or shocking that really happened here. It felt like this match was largely a waste of time. Now, when it comes to the response to this review of Clash of Champions, I'm sure I'm going to get those that are going to think I wasn't hard enough on this show, that I should have really blasted on it. Those are going to think, ah, it was just about right. And then those that are going to sit there and say, I don't like anything, I'm so negative, this show was really good. This show was not really good. I saw SmackDown's backlash two weeks ago, and I thought that show was much better. And even then, it was only adequate. This was a horrible initial offering for the Raw pay-per-view brands. This was horrible. A lot of these matches, the psychology was so fucked up. Several of the finishes were lame and disappointing. And it just it felt like, again, because Raw is three hours every week, and there's a reason I really don't watch that show live anymore, that I come on and I watch a three-hour pay-per-view on the network, and it feels like I'm just watching an extension of Raw, another episode of Raw. Thank God I'm not paying 50-something bucks for it, but that still doesn't give me three hours of my life back that I mostly wasted watching this shit. 